good morning. Uh, we're going to do a quick walkthrough of the internal and external anatomy of a salmon. We've already studied the uh, life cycle and uh, habitat of the salmon, so we're going to take a peek at the anatomy here. It's Thanksgiving Day on 2015, and yesterday we uh, caught this one out of the Wilson River with uh, Tanner's Guide Service. So, thank you, Tanner. No problem, buddy. Okay, so we'll start out with the uh, external anatomy of the salmon. Uh, if you take a look at the head here, first thing you can notice is the uh, hook jaw. This is a Chinook salmon. You'll notice the hook jaw here and here. Um, big large teeth. The hook jaw tells us this is a male headed back up river. Um, and you can take a look at the teeth. The teeth are used for uh, grappling to defend the red and also uh, in courtship. So we also here can see the nostril, uh, which is used for smelling, not for breathing, um, as we humans do. Eyeball, obviously. Um, and then here we have the operculum which is the gill cover. Uh, if they didn't have these, their delicate gills would be quite damaged and they would die and not reproduce. So if we look at the gills here, we can see three uh, main structures. We see the actual gill filaments themselves, which you'll notice are very thin and have a lot of surface area so that the water passing through, which has dissolved oxygen in it, um, it's getting the most exposure to the water as it can so it can pull out as much oxygen as possible. Um, as you know, there's not much dissolved oxygen in water, even in highly oxygenated streams compared to our air, not very much. So, higher surface area uh, means better oxygen pull out of the water. You'll see several different rows stacked up against each other. Here we have the gill arch, which is the structure that the gills are attached to. And uh, finally, the gill rakers, which uh, help protect things from hitting these. Anything, any sediment in the water will often get hooked on these and also uh, sometimes used for filter feeding so that if a nymph or something would hit these, uh, usually in their younger stages, it would also it would pass in to the stomach and be digested. So that is how they breathe. Next onto the fins, uh, we'll take a look here at what we've got. Here, you can think about this, if you think about this like a human body, this is right about where uh, your arms would be, right about here, and uh, you know, um, your chest muscles are called your pectoral muscles, so this fin likewise is called the pectoral fin, kind of think about it like it's at the chest of the salmon. Here uh, we have what is called the pelvic fin, which if you think about a human, would be right about where the pelvis would be, uh, your waist just about. Um, and then here down the bottom side we have what is commonly called the vent or the urogenital opening um, Which we'll talk about a little bit in the internal anatomy and here uh, is the anal fin also because this Serves as the anus for expulsion of waste here. We have the caudal fin um, Which is the tail fin obviously uh, and the adipose fin right here and the dorsal fin up here we can look at the fins in a couple of different ways, but let's start with the caudal fin, uh, which is the main source of propulsion for the fish. Uh, obviously, it sweeps back and forth, which pushes water aside and propels the fish forward. Um, a fish is a big, long creature, and the muscles throughout the body will contract and extend to uh, move the tail back and forth. If we look at this fin, uh, the anal fin, this fin is kind of like the keel on a boat. If you think about a kayak, the bottom is smooth and rounded, um, and it can tilt back and forth. If you, if you look at a sailboat, on the bottom it has a very long, uh, narrow structure called a keel. Uh, and if you think about that, if the, if the wind hits the sail of a sailboat, there's a lot of sideways pressure, which would cause a boat without a keel to rock back and forth. But larger sailboats have this structure to keep them upright, to keep them from rolling around. This serves the same function along with the uh, overall elongated shape of the body to keep the fish from rolling around in currents. Uh, the pectoral fins here are essentially used for some turning. Uh, if they were backing up, they would use those to push aside. These are mainly for navigation. You're not going to get much force out of these. This is the main propulsion here on the caudal fin. Uh, 
the dorsal fin serves essentially the same function as the anal fin, which is keeping the fish upright. And the adipose fin is essentially uh, what we call a vestigial structure, which means that at some point in this fish's evolutionary history, this would have served a purpose. Uh, nowadays, in this, at this point in their evolutionary lineage, not doing very much. The one thing we do use it for is to tell whether the fish is a wild or a native. Since this doesn't serve very much of a purpose for the fish, um, in the hatchery, oh, thank you, wild or hatchery, um, since this doesn't serve much of a purpose for the fish's life, it will survive just as well with or without this fin. So humans have decided uh, at hatcheries that they will clip young steelhead and salmon's fins and trout uh, to mark whether it came from a hatchery or from the wild. Since this is here, uh, we know that this is indeed a wild fish. Now, one last structure that we need to talk about here is the uh, lateral line, which if you look at the coloration of the fish and the scales, uh, we see one line that goes through here. Now this line is uh, basically for sensing vibrations through the water which serves a lot of different purposes for fish. Number one, they can sense uh, predators. Number two, they can sense prey. Uh, it helps them detect what's going on around them and it's, it's a lot like a human ear in the sense that it um, senses vibrations just like our ears interpret vibrations in the air as sound. Uh, salmon do have an ear, however, it has no external ear opening but they do have an internal ear. So, uh, one last note about the coloration. And for that, I'm gonna roll her up here, roll him up. If you look down from the top, you see that we have a very dark top with uh, some speckles on the side. And now if you think about a uh, fish making its way up the river, any predator that's coming down on top of it, if it was able to see it, obviously this is a great snack uh, and it would do its best to eat it. Um, with this coloration, this is going to blend in darkness with just about any bottom and spots with rocks and pebbles and things like that. So it's almost like a camouflage pattern that will help it survive predators. If you look at the coloration on the side, it's mostly silver. And now this fish has just come in from the ocean. If you think about the ocean and you're looking at things from the side, if you're some kind of a predator like a, uh, another predatory fish, you look at this and it's going to look, it's going to blend in more with the water around it. And if you look at the bottom, it's going to be a little dirty, but ugh, we have a white belly, basically a very light belly. Um, and that's so any predator from underneath will look up and it will basically look almost like, uh, almost like the air would from when you're looking up through the water. Uh, so some pretty neat coloration and adaptation for survival here. And later on, we'll talk about how adaptations come about. Alright, um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to cut the fish open, and uh, I'm hoping to eat this, so uh, we're going to cut it open just like you would if you're catching trout or filleting it. We start here at the vent, the urogenital opening, which is the end of the urinary tract and the end of the reproductive tract and the end of the excretory tract, and we're going to cut up here, and I'm going to do so without injuring myself because I've done that before and let me tell you, it is not fun. Oh my goodness, it was terrible. So, what we're doing is we're just cutting up the underside. We should get a nice peek into this fish here. I'm gonna move around the other side so we get out of your way. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Let's take a look at this. There we have it. All right, so we've already talked about how the uh, gills take oxygen from the water. So one of the first things I want you to take a peek at, if I can find it in here, is the heart. Ooh, maybe we can even take a look up here. 
it is kind of disgusting but I'm squeezing on the heart and actually forcing blood out through you can see some bubbles there almost pumping his heart for him so the heart is essentially like a pump and uh, what that's doing is it's pumping the blood throughout the body so you can see right here the heart is connected into the gills um, and that's essentially what it's doing is it's pulling the uh, pulling the blood throughout the body so that oxygen, which is needed for cellular respiration, uh, basically how muscles move, and uh, what that's going to do is just pump that throughout the body so every cell can get good, oxygenated, nutrient-rich blood. So, what we've got here, this thing with finger-like appendages, this is the pyloric cica which is still kind of a mystery to scientists, uh, but one of the big things it does that we know it does is, uh, oh, let's bust that out of there, ooh, it uh, secretes digestive enzymes. So enzymes are things that help chemical reactions occur, uh, proteins, and they are going to help break down the food. So kind of a mystery what it does, but a very neat structure. On the test, finger-like appendages, pyloric cica. So, you can see a lot of things in here. I'll try to point it out one by one. This right here is the fish's liver. And what the liver does is it's going to filter out the blood and make sure... Ooh, boy, oh boy, oh that's... Oh! Let's use that knife. What the liver's going to do, it's going to filter out the blood and uh, any poisons or just nasty gunk is going to get filtered out. So a lot of blood flow throughout there and lots of tiny little passages for things to go through because the more surface area that something like that has, uh, the better it's going to get its job done. The next thing, uh, you can see right here, this kind of, uh, this tube here attaches up here and of course if we look through their mouth, we can see that that's just about where this tube attaches. So this tube is the stomach. Now if you look at this, you think, gee whiz, that does not look like a stomach because there's nothing in it. Think about the life cycle of a salmon. Um, as they're coming back up into the rivers, they aren't eating. Uh, so they're just driving up based on fat reserves. So there's nothing in here. There's no, you know, they haven't been eating bait fish, they haven't been eating nymph, so it's pretty much empty. Now there might still be some things in here that have gone down their throat, but they're not eating with the purpose of getting calories. And you'll notice that the pyloric cica, the finger-like appendages, the little spaghetti guy, uh, is attached to the stomach. Why might that be? Because it makes digestive enzymes which would go to the digestive tract. So uh, here we have the spleen which is going to clean the blood kind of like the liver. Uh, another similarly uh, bloody porous organ. But let's travel on down. Here's the stomach. Here we have the pyloric cica, which attaches to the intestines. Now the intestines are where um, all of the... So the stomach breaks down the food, and then the intestines are going to absorb nutrients that the stomach has digested. So we've got a nice long uh, intestine here. And interestingly enough, with fish, uh, herbivorous fish, fish that are going to eat plants, have a longer digestive tract, in general, the stomach and the intestine, uh, because it's tougher to get nutrients out of plants than it is with meat, necessarily. And you'll notice uh, right up here where we cut into the urogenital opening, we see that this intestine goes directly there. And what is that? Oh boy, that's some nasty something. Oh, wee <laughs> Here we've got a, uh, oh, a little crab hand or something. That's part of a sand shrimp. Sand shrimp, is it? Someone probably hooked Sand shrimp, probably crab. Sand so, shrimp. might have taken somebody's sand shrimp and uh, gotten through. We got, so it's kind of neat. Yes, I am touching salmon poop, but it's for science. We look here, see what else we got. A little twig. I get a good look at that. Can you see that? So we can, we can cut this open and have some fun with it. But I want to point out a couple of things. This here, this is an air sac, um, also known as the air bladder. Uh, this is in fish 
because fish, if you think about it, uh, can move about through the water column pretty fl freely. And if you think about going to the bottom of a swimming pool, you can feel that pressure, all that water pressure building up on you. Now, this is what this is going to do is it's an air sac uh, to help keep the fish buoyant. And if you're a fisherman, you might know if you're fishing deep waters uh, and you pull a fish in, sometimes when you put it back in the water, it has trouble getting back down. That's because as they come up, the air in the air bladder is going to expand. Um, and as it expands, it's, you know, it is less dense, so it's going to be a little more difficult for it to get down below the water. So for some fish, for some kinds of fishing, what you do is you actually puncture a little hole in the air bladder so that it can drain out and they can submerge back down and then the small hole would heal up. So this big old organ here, this is only present in the males. Pause and discuss. Just kidding. Uh, this is the male genitalia connected through here to the urogenital opening. Um, and that's going to be where the male produces his sperm, or in fish we call it milt. Uh, milt is basically the uh, milky white substance that they secrete to fertilize the eggs. So, there's that. Alright, let's do a little cleanup here. Here is the fish's other testicle being removed. And then up here, where the swim bladder attaches, you can really see now how it holds in the air. Um, and we are going to just do a little, oh, this is, this knife is not very sharp, which is dangerous. you gotta, got to have a sharp knife. But you can see it is just an empty sack that uh, would hold air. So that's the air sack again. When we get up here, if you think about human beings, and beans, human beings and beans. Think about kidney beans. Kidney beans are called kidney beans because they are shaped and look like the human kidney. Now, the fish kidney serves the same purpose as a human kidney, but the fish's kidney is actually right up against their backbone. Uh, so, what that's gonna do is that's gonna filter out after the blood has run its course through the body. Um, the kidney, kidney's job is to filter out cellular waste that has been sent there uh, through the bloodstream. The kidney pulls that out of the blood and puts it into urine. So, clean that out of there. And this is maybe a little more detailed than you do if you're just cleaning out a fish, but we're getting into the Getting into the meat harvesting part here, so get that all out of there. So, uh, last minor note about the fish anatomy um, is the bone structure. Uh, fish skeletons are a lot like a lot of skeletons. I mean, skeletons all have a lot in common, but essentially, a fish skeleton has some neat adaptations for life in the water. Uh, one, the vertebrae run the whole course so that uh, just like we can turn our backs, the fish can turn its whole body because of the joints that go throughout. Also, it has very thin, flexible bones uh, throughout the side. And again, this is all for movement in water. Uh, it supports the body as well. The muscle gives the muscles something to attach to, something to move, something to pull. Um, and you can see also here, we've got veins running through, and veins are gonna deliver blood to the muscles uh, oxygenated blood so that the muscles can complete cellular respiration and release energy. So, that is uh, the salmon inside and out. So, thanks for watching and uh, ace the test. Have a good one.